love a good controversy, don't we? Yes, even you, the non-gamer, is only here for the kick scammer videos. But let me tell you something. If you want real controversy, there's a tad more widespread than the unreleased picnic cooler, then look no further than video games. Yep, YouTube is bloody full of controversial video game topics, and although it may seem like I'm flogging a dead horse here, you can be damn sure that all of these horrifically brilliant titles will indeed one day get the full, complete history treatment. Heck, I already covered such controversial topics in full on this series, such as Grand Theft Auto, Splatterhouse, House of the Dead, and Night Trap. Oh, no, wait. That one's still to come. Regardless today, I'm doing it all again with another pretty legendary series of games from the world of controversy. And for all of you Kickscammer fans, well, there is a little sprinkle of that towards the end of this video too. But until that time when I do take you for a ride, I think it's time that I say, join me as we take a look at the entire Carmageddon franchise from its creators, its movie inspired beginnings, its sequels including the Kickstarter one and of course its games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. Everybody that wasn't a gamer wanted this game banned, but that was kinda always the plan. In fact, it's what they was going for, but perhaps this was a tad too far. Oh yes, I think we're in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves here guys. So let's go back to the beginning. Yes, I think it will come to the surprise of nobody when I tell you that this game was inspired by this. Patrick Buckland was the programmer that was also into a little bit of banger racing too, and his friend Neil Barnden often came to watch him smash up his motor in the name of fun. The two were the founders of a new game development studio called Stainless Games. They both had experience in gaming before this, but this was their chance to focus more on game development itself. Sadly, however, finding a publisher that actually wanted to get a new studio to make a game, experienced or not, wasn't always the easiest option, and after a year of searching, it was Argonaut who came a-knocking. Although it wasn't to create a game, but instead to actually help create a 3D engine instead, which they did with the Brenda engine. It helped pay the bills whilst we were trying to get a contract in, so without it, Stainless would probably have fizzled into nothingness. The 3D game engine software development continued for a further two years, and the two continued to push game ideas to bigger companies, and finally it was Sales Curve Interactive, aka SCI, who gave them the go-ahead to work on what is essentially a 3D destruction derby game. And yes, this was before the release of the PlayStation 1 Classic game too. The project got greenlit back in October of 1994 at a London Computer Graphics Expo, but frustratingly a whole year passed after this thumbs up was given before the game even properly continued development from its early tech demo state. The original plan was to turn this basic banger racing simulator game into a Mad Max game. The problem was that SCI just couldn't get the license to do so. So, second chance was to create something based around the upcoming sequel of Death Race 2000. During this time, plenty of ideas got thrown into the mix, such as running over people for points of course, and the brilliantly named Pratt Cam, which shows the reactions of the characters that you play whilst you drive. But sadly, when the Death Race sequel got cancelled, the Stainless Duo obviously got pretty wound up. Sod it, let's just do it anyway, who needs a license? And by using the previously mentioned Brenda engine, they got to work creating Carmageddon. I repeat, one minute to reach commencement. Members of the public, you will now have one minute to reach minimum safe distance. It was a gruelling 15 months for Stainless who had 8 people in total working on the game and as Neil explains this was the pioneering age of moving to 3D polygon type gameplay. It wasn't creativity that was the issue, they had plenty of that, 
but instead the problem was how to translate these awesome new ideas into a reality. The game engine that they helped make was free to use and the training of the staff at Stainless was also done in-house, keeping the overall cost of a game as legendary as Carmageddon down to a minimum. Thankfully, these speed bumps were passed over quicker than expected and the working relationship between Stainless and SCI was a really, really good one. SCI gave us our start in the industry and we have a great relationship with them. They just let us get on with making the game and really didn't interfere at all, apart from constructive criticism along the way. Each month the producers would pop over to the island to see us, they'd look at the build, we'd have a laugh and they'd go away for another month. And I think it's the incredible relationship and Stainless's consistent persistence on not giving up on the newish 3D world building that got the game finished because... On the 13th of June 1997 in Sweden for some reason and exactly one week later for American and European markets, the game was released for PC. So, let's take a look. Well, straight away, this is exactly what a game originally intended to be a Mad Max and then Death Race game would be like. You choose your characters brilliantly named Mad Mike and Diana. There is more to that in a little bit, but the similarities don't stop there either, as Mad Mike's Red Eagle takes heavy inspiration from the alligator car from Death Race 2000. But yeah, the game, well, Play it however you want. You can run over all of the pedestrians for profit, destroy your opponents for profit, or simply win the race circuit for profit. It's as simple as that. Play the game however you want, and earn enough moolah to upgrade your car several times over, with an extra upgrade available to you when you complete the game. There really isn't much to a game like Carmageddon, but then again, I don't think anybody was really expecting too much either. Just kill a load of people while listening to Fear Factory and have a heck of a good time doing just that. This doesn't make the game bad, as stated before many times in the Complete History series, when a game gets it right as much as this one does, it doesn't matter how simple it is. Sure you may have picked it up because of its crazy and controversial nature, but unlike other games, this one actually is a good game too. From the get-go, so many mechanics and ideas got pushed into this and when putting your 1997 nostalgia goggles on, you realise just how impressive it is for the time. In an interview with Retro Gamer magazine, Neil explains how the game was pushing the boundaries of DOS gaming for the time, and rightfully so. He is without a doubt very proud of this and his team's accomplishment. An open world game with accurate for the time damage to cars that actually change the way that they play in the game, items and cars also having their own physics accessories and including a replay system too, it was very obvious that the team at Stainless knew what they was doing. And although the same formula is pretty much a dime a dozen nowadays with plenty of games including this game's own sequels doing it better. You can't take away the incredible impact that a game like Carmageddon, the original Carmageddon, had on the gaming world. Sadly, however, quite a few people saw it as nothing more than an extreme gore fest created and played by very disturbed people. As stated, in the game you need to run over and kill many different people for points. This is something they decide to go full pelt with in an attempt to generate as much publicity as possible. And in fact, the team even sent in the game to the British Board of Film Classification in an attempt to get it an 18 rating. They didn't need to do this, but they wanted the publicity. But this did backfire, and even though they loved the game at the BBFC, they said that they would only certify it if all of the blood and gore was removed. The newspapers jumped on board to share their disapproval of the game. One of the worst was Ban Def Game Now Pope. 
Yes, the actual Pope wanted this game removed. Well, that's what it looked like initially anyway, until you read the rest of the article and the cunningly titled Pope was actually referencing Greg Pope, a British Member of Parliament. Not the, um, you know, the actual Pope. One of the people you run over in the game was an old lady with a Zimmer frame that said the now popular, I was in the war. Yeah, that upset age concern. A blind pressure group didn't like the fact that you can run over blind people in the game. And Road Peace had a good debate over the game too. But the worst was yet to come. The game came out in June of 1997 and sadly only two months later, in August of the very same year, Princess Diana died in a horrific car crash. And with her name being slightly similar to the female protagonist, Di Anna, as you would expect, the newspapers found plenty more ammunition to moan about the game once again. It was the running over of people and getting rewarded for doing so that got people's backs up. And that is why, in certain parts of the world, they got changed for zombies or robots. Obviously, with the internet being what it is, even back then, fan sites popped up to provide hacks that would reinstate the bloody mess of the original. And after Stainless won the court case battle against the BBFC, they released an official patch called Splat Pack to take it back to its official roots. This Splat Pack version of the game also features plenty of new characters, new levels, and even some nice 3D acceleration. And of course, both came in a multi pack eventually, too. Almost instantly after the release of Carmageddon, Stainless decided to get to work on Carmageddon 2 Carpocalypse Now. Ah, oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, it kind of works, I suppose. Well, obviously, as you can see, the graphics have been overhauled and then some. And although personally I prefer the grittier look of the original, especially the pedestrians, I can't deny this is the better game. Now, in all fairness, I did play this before I played the original, but, you know, hey-ho. Running over people and smashing up your opponents was simply a lot of fun back then, and it's a lot of fun here too. But with all of that, the game feels a lot more rounded this time, with 40 characters, the worlds that you race in feel a little bit more planned out this time, and although not loved by all, the missions found in between certain races actually do quite a good job of splitting up the mindless fun. And just like last time, the same censorship of zombies and red blood turning green found its way into certain territories with the internet yet again providing unofficial patches and stainless themselves, releasing an official blood pack a year later, pushing this game from a 15 certificate to an 18 certificate. Next up was the third game in the series, Carmageddon Total Destruction Racing 2000 or TDR 2000 for short. But sadly, this time it wasn't made by the stainless guys themselves, but instead it was contracted out to an Australian developer, Taurus Games. Most people don't like this entry and even stainless themselves don't see this one as an entry. They just don't feel like it's part of the original series. And that goes for the add-on pack too, obviously. And obviously, when you start to play it, you won't see what the big deal is. The graphics are arguably a lot more detailed, and it is essentially the same as Carmageddon 2 in the handling department. The problem is, simple ideas that made the series so great up to this point, such as running over pedestrians, seem very much like an afterthought in this third entry, and incredibly hard to do. It may be that we already had our fill of mindless carnage up to this point, but honestly, entry number three just feels incredibly boring. The designs are boring, the AI is absolutely terrible, and even though it was the first time I had ever played it for this video, I really did struggle to keep pushing on. Unlike the original games and expansions, TDR 2000 is a forgettable pothole in the Carmageddon series. And by this point, the series had moved on to several different home consoles too. And the first one we should probably look at is the PlayStation port. It's actually not a bad port in my opinion, obviously not as good as the original, and reviews at the time were very, very harsh, getting below average scores pretty much across the board. Essentially, it's the same game, however the controls and zombie placement is a tad off. 
is a pretty okay port in my eyes with different chapters implemented and different tracks too. Its main downfall is it's not as good as the original PC releases all of those years ago. But with that said, it's a hell of a lot better than the N64 release. Oh yes, if you guys like angry reviewer gaming channels, then there is a high chance that you know of this one already. Carmageddon 64 is often put up there as being the worst game, not just in the series, but on the entire N64, sitting right next to Superman 64. The graphics are awful, the pedestrians are almost non-existent, the audio is piercing, and the gameplay is hard to control and hard to keep playing. Without a doubt, this is the worst entry in the series. And another port came in shortly after named Carmageddon, and this time it's for the Game Boy Color. Yeah, not going to spend too long on this one guys, if you can imagine a Carmageddon game done in a top down setting with a few pedestrians and get this, the removal of car destruction, then well, you've got this game. It's probably quite impressive for the system, but it honestly doesn't play very well at all, and is actually quite tedious to play. Oh, and by the way, I didn't mention this earlier, but both this version and the N64 version were actually based off Carmageddon 2. Apparently. Yeah. Okay. This was the end of Carmageddon games for a little while as the license had moved around quite a bit in recent years, getting further and further away from those original developers. Stainless did, however, work on a port of the game for the Gizmondo that was pretty close to completion before being completely cancelled. There was another port being made to the Game Boy Color 2, this time it was the third game they were porting and that one got cancelled too and a ROM has never shown up online as of the making of this video. And yet another unreleased game with the title Carmageddon 4 was announced for the PlayStation 4 but was cancelled for unknown reasons. A couple of Carmageddon games made their way to Java phones in 2005 and although I have actually not played these ones, they're apparently awful as I'm sure you were all expecting. And finally, a revamped version of the cancelled Gizmondo game was released in 2012 and 2013 for Apple and Android phones respectively. That actually was pretty damn good, and all of this was going on whilst the Kickstarter was happening. Wait, what? Kickstarter? Yes. Cue the music. I wanna take you for a ride. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's kick scammer time. Because when Stainless finally got the license of Carmageddon back from Square Enix, who got it from buying EDOS, who got it from buying SCI, they decided to launch a Kickstarter for a new game, asking for $400,000 and getting $625,143 from 15,736 backers. <laughs> yes, Carmageddon was back. And the game was actually released. As a Carmageddon fan, and I'm talking about the first two here, it almost feels like an HD mod with a good amount of bells and whistles added on. And is that what we want? I think so. I mean, literally the way you take damage, rebuild your car, which actually zooms in from wherever it came off, which is a really nice touch. The way the physics feel and the pedestrians are nothing more than tiny amps for you to bulldoze over feels pretty much perfect. You can upgrade through progressing in the game. It's Carmageddon, all right. It's pretty much the same game. This, mixed with the fact that the game had pretty awful loading times and choppy as all hell gameplay, ended the game on a very mediocre review from the vast majority of media outlets who played it and the backers who backed it. Thankfully, however, this does lead us into the final game in the series, Carmageddon Max Damage. In an attempt to right the wrongs of the previous game, they decided to kinda start again and rebrand this into a remake of sorts. Yes, by the time this was released, a lot of, if not all of the issues were fixed with updates and bug patches over on the PC release, but still, fair play to these guys for doing this the right way. Everybody that owns the Carmageddon reincarnation game would get a free copy of this game. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why I actually love Kickstarter when it goes right. Because when things do go wrong, which every good project will eventually go wrong, otherwise it would be a finished product to start with, 
you get to see the mishaps firsthand. And sure, that may result in a delayed product, but at least you get the final product eventually and see the progress along the way. The game is essentially the Game of the Year edition with some extra stuff thrown in, which changes the campaign somewhat. Nothing here is bad, and if it wasn't for the crazy amounts of garbage leading up to this release, I would have been a lot more excited. However, it is essentially Carmageddon for the now generation. Perhaps it's the fact that I've been playing way too much of the same style of game for this video, and I totally get that. But honestly, I can't really think of anything else they could really add here besides a few extra multiplayer options. Which is why I think it's time for this series to simply chill out for a couple of generations. If you like what you see, you're no doubt going to like this game. It's never going to become your favourite, it's simply going to be a great way to lose some time. And that's exactly what Carmageddon Max Damage is the perfect game for. You can get through your entire Crater Slopes game room complete history beers with a few mates in this game until you're too drunk to continue playing and you're singing power ballads at the top of your lungs and headbanging to your favourite metal albums. And although that may sound like I'm ragging on the series, I just want you guys to know, I'm not. The world needs mindless, senseless and stupid violence. Not just us, the gamers, but the media that knows no better. And although we may have been shoehorned plenty of crappy sequels in the middle of its life, the legacy of this mostly awesome series will live on till the day that you are run over by Diana herself for nothing more than a few measly points. And I wouldn't have it any other way. See you later. Yes, guys, thanks for checking out the video. I want to give a big special shout out to all of my Patreons, of course. But first, let's give a big shout out to this video sponsor. Once again, Player One Clothing. Be sure to go over to the website that you see on the screen and use code SGR20 for 20% off all of your retro gaming and movie related garments. And of course, if you guys want to go and pre order yourself the Mega Drive Mini, then there's links below for that or any of the games that you see playing on the screen. But anyway, back to those Patreons do a big special shout out going to that retro video gamer Gary Pinkett, Mantis, Ryan Burford, Andrew Dalton, Ben Jackson, Jonathan Hayward, Christopher Turbill, Phil Lowlands, Tomic Grabowski, Vista Vestek, Michael Corvin, Hawk89, Dina Robertson Dunn, Lefty Intrigued Gaming, Abby Morris, Tim Labonte, Sobi Quang DX, Tim Lunn, Hananas, Pixels.Limited, aka Samuel Victor, Red the Beard, Comrade Constantine, Pretendo64, Casey Garner, Creamy Elephant, Blitz Hedgy, King Link Reviews, Gemma at Mr. T's Shirts, Ampity, Prime Time, Penny Sleeve, Mike H. Fell, Lucas Softail, Ye Old Hamburglar, Gregory Arden, Ronnie Method, SSWB, Sonic's Captor, Jeremy Rodriguez, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Marcus King, Cat Tyndall, June, The Geeky Dad, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Todd Paul Float G, Petty Mew, and Bew Wright. If you want to get your name shouted out, get your name shown, come and see what I'm working on, and come and join the exclusive rooms on Discord and see plenty of other updates then please do click the link that you see on the screen. Don't forget to subscribe, give the video a thumbs up, a thumbs down, whatever you prefer. But for now, this is DJ Slope signing out, and hopefully I'll see you all next time.